Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Battle Walks. Thank you once again for joining us. And don't forget, if you want to support the show and listen without ads, you can do so by buying us a coffee. And I'll put a link in the show notes to show you how you can do that. But even just by listening, you are supporting the program. And so we appreciate it. So tell your friends, add a review. That's always helpful as well. If you can add a review and a star rating, we really appreciate it. And it helps more people find the program. Today, we are back walking the World War II battlefields. We've received a a fantastic response to the previous episodes we've done in the New Guinea region, and now we're going to really round out the trio. We've done Kokoda over several episodes. We've done Milne Bay, and now we're going to do the beachheads uh, on the north coast of New Guinea. So just a fascinating chapter of World War II history, particularly in 1942, stretching into 1943. And joining me to help us on this battle walk is uh, my current co-host, uh, as Pete Smith is still tied up on the battlefields. It's David Howe. Dave, thanks for joining us once again on Battle Walks. Great to be back, Matt. Mate, over the years we've been talking, over the recent years, about obviously the impact that COVID has had on the <laughs> battlefield touring industry. Um, we're back now. We are. You are back leading tours of Kokoda. We're doing tours to the Western Front and Gallipoli and all over the world. Um, but it's still been quite a treat, mate, to uh, to walk the battlefields in this virtual sense uh, via this pod- podcast. How have you found the experience? I found it uh, different in the sense that uh, it gives me an opportunity to reflect uh, when you're up there and you're taking people around, whether it be Kokoda or Milne Bay or what we're going to talk about today with the beachheads, uh, you're very much caught up in the moment. And um, as, a, as a guide or a trek leader, you don't always have the... Um, uh, I guess the ability in that moment to to think, oh, okay, we've just this is what this is what it would be like if you were somebody that hadn't done it before. And I think it's been a good experience for me trying to put myself in the shoes of um, of a person wanting to take a pilgrimage to a battlefield, not being there before, and to see what you know what you could tell them and describe to them before they go there, so they get a bit of an idea of what um, what they are to expect. Well, if you're listening to this podcast and you haven't. Uh, listen to our previous ones, please go back and do that because it's been quite an experience. And David, it took us three episodes, I think, to get across the Kokoda track. We managed to do Milne Bay in one. We're going to cover the Northern Beachheads in a single episode as well. And that that really does round out particularly the Australian story of the key parts of the New Guinea battlefield. I know there are many more. I'm not trying to say this covers the entire multi-year New Guinea campaign, but it does give us a very good overview of what the Australians went through, particularly in those opening years of the fighting in New Guinea, doesn't it? It does. And um, really, 1942, 80 years uh, for all of these um, battles that we're talking about. It's the 80th anniversary, of course, and um, the five key battles fought in what was then Australian territory in Papua. As you said, we've really well and truly gone over the Kokoda track. Uh, We've covered Milne Bay and we're covering uh, now those three key battles um, at the end of the Kokoda campaign, which is Gona, Buna, and San Ananda. Well, give us an overview of the historic background to the ground we're going to be walking in this key area. So in essence, um, these three places, uh, Gona, Buna, and San Ananda, are located around about 90 to 100 kilometres north of Kokoda, and they are on the north coast of Papua. So if you're looking at the map, imagine... Um, right at the top of, of, of Papua itself, uh, heading out to the Solomon Sea. And this is the place where the Japanese, of course, from our earlier podcast, it's where they landed when they did their overland tack towards Port Moresby over the Kokoda Track. But it's also the place where uh, the battles finish. So it starts there for the Japanese. But of course, after the campaigns in the Owen Stanleys, it's where the Australians and, and with the help of the Americans drive the um, Japanese out of, out of Papua. So tell us about some of the fighting that took place in those beachhead campaigns after the tough work on the Kokoda track was already done. Yeah, so a lot of people may not be aware, but actually the um, amount of casualties that the Australians received, and the Japanese for that matter, most of it happens in these low areas north of Kokoda. So finishing off from where we left with um, the Kokoda campaign, the Australians arrive in, in to Kokoda on the 2nd of November They have no resistance. On the 3rd of November, they hoist the Australian flag and that signifies the retaking of Kokoda. But the fighting was only really just getting underway for these final parts of the Kokoda campaign or the extension of the Kokoda campaign, if you will. So basically, the Australian um, that uh, um, arrived at Kokoda could open up the airfield. 
But immediately north of Kokoda, like, I mean, very close to Kokoda, you had places in particular, Oivi Garari. And so by around the 12th of November, you, you are getting a Japanese um, creating this blocking action. A lot of Australians um, uh, on their way through, some for the very first time, including the 25th Brigade, uh, which is meeting this Japanese resistance who really were creating a blocking force, if you will, to um, slow the um, their enemy, us, of course, advancing to, to, to where they have their beachheads. And I might add that the best way for a listener to, um, you know, get a picture in their head, you imagine we've got uh, a northern, we've got a coastline on the northern uh, tip of P- Papua and the Japanese have built um, defensive positions and they have... Uh, they're not facing out to sea, rather they're facing back towards where we're going to, well, where, when I say we, where the Allies and the Australians are going to advance towards them. And we shouldn't forget the role of the Americans in all of this, David, because throughout the New Guinea campaign, the fighting was also carrying on at Guadalcanal. And I've spoken to a lot of veterans from both of those campaigns, and there was always a big uh, sort of argument back in the US about who had it tougher, because even though the beachhead campaigns weren't as well known as the Guadalcanal campaign. A lot of men who fought in sort of Bunagona, San Ananda, that area, um, talked about they had it tougher than than what the uh, the guys were going through on Guadalcanal. So pretty tough fighting for the Americans, not just the Australians. Indeed, and in particular, um, we talk about uh, in the campaign about the AIF and the militia, but it's important to note that the um, that the American soldiers that were coming to uh, that would fight. Uh, in particular at, at Buna and, and nearby at Cape Enderhair. Um, these guys uh, from the 128th Regiment, these were, I guess, what they call national servicemen, so their version of militia. In fact, um, their battalion uh, or their regimental history, Montana Mud, these guys had come out to Australia and, in fact, they were in Victoria before they go up to the northern beachheads and they're training at Seymour up near um, Pakapunyal up near where the army base is today. And they're they're training on rocky, dry, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, sparsely wooded Australian bush, which, of course, in Victoria is nothing like what they're about to come up against in the swamp lands of of, uh, the northern beaches of of Papua. David, this campaign really should be better known, shouldn't it, both in Australia and also in America? And, you know, I saw the, you know, I saw a a high-ranking US military man speaking recently where he was talking about the the long links of service that go back to the First World War between America and Australia, and he was making the point that it's more important today than it's ever been. Obviously, the the battles, the beachhead, the beachhead battles define that better than just about anything else, and yet they've, they've really slipped through the, the, the cracks of history, haven't they? Is this a battle that you think we should know more about? Uh, definitely. I think, um, I think it was fair to say uh, that you know, Kokoda obviously took the um, because of the nature, I guess, of the of this of the Owen Stanleys and the track and all those things that come with it, sort of rose to the surface. And and Milne Bay was kind of left to the side. It started to come into its own now, with lots of books being written on, a lot of attention given to it. But the Beachheads campaign have almost been a little bit of an afterthought to a certain degree, especially um, uh, in in recent times. Uh, we, we've seen a lot of books written about Kokoda, but the Northern Beachheads, it's important to to put in perspective, you know, just from a casualty point of view from Australia, you know, you're talking three times the casualties suffered, inflicted upon Australians. Um, and, you know, roughly 600 Australians died in, in the Owen Stanleys on the Kokoda but, um, uh, campaign. But with the Northern Beachheads, you know, you're looking at, um, you know, 1,400 odd Australians that lost their lives fighting at these um, last positions where the Japanese were, uh, had their holdout, and you know we have many more Australians who have family and relatives that are connected to it. And I should add that as time marches on and we're eighty years past the battles, the some of the men that fought there, and I'm thinking now of the New South Wales Battalion of the 55th, 53rd. These guys were a little bit younger uh, than say the AAF guys, and we are still. I mean, there's only a handful of them left, but they're the guys who are still surviving today. And that was their battle, not so much up in the in the mountains. But down on the beaches, and um, yeah, it would be um, great if, especially now being the 80th anniversary, that more more attention gets put on these northern beachheads campaigns. I certainly agree with that, and the nature of the fighting. I mean, not to take anything away from Kokoda, obviously, but the nature of the fighting on the beachheads, advancing <coughs> against entrenched positions, um, mach- you know, coming under machine gun fire, and the Japanese, we should state this, knew that this was their last roll of the dice. They they'd seen their comrades 
fighting on the Kokoda track. They'd seen them pull back. They had been ordered to hold the beachheads at all cost. This was desperate fighting from the Japanese. And as we know, when you cornered the Japanese in the Pacific, the fighting was absolutely brutal. Indeed. And it's also important to note where it relates uh, and I, I make mention of this with Kokoda, when the Japanese withdrew down to their beachhead, they had um, not only uh, thought that they could regroup, obviously Guadalcanal that you spoke about took away a lot of resources because all the Japanese that were uh, soldiers that were fighting on Guadalcanal and in Papua were coming from Rabaul, which had been taken earlier in 1942 by the Japanese. That was their base. But it's important to note that the Japanese did get reinforcements. So prior and during the beachhead campaign, um, two important things happen which don't aren't, aren't going to sit well for the Allies. And one is that um, um, that we had started to, and when I say we, the, the Allies had started to put an air bridge, if you will, um, from Port Moresby and a fight with a fighter umbrella, so the air bridge bringing in um, supplies. So after they have a few contacts just immediately north of Kokoda, the, the Japanese um, have withdrawn back and they're dug in on the beachheads. And I'll talk about that in a moment about their defensive positions but we create um, an air bridge we open up an airfield um, uh, you know in between Kokoda and the northern beachheads if you will and we sort of controlled that but the Americans for example had brought in some were attempting to bring around some heavy supplies so big big weapon like artillery um, you know all the stuff that they need to wage war and it was actually sunk by um, um, J- Japanese um, um, aircraft that had come from um, Ley and Salamau, which was further up the, the coastline in, in what is known as New Guinea. So that happens. But also the Japanese get some 2,000 uh, reinforcements coming down. So yes, they're making their stand, but they do have some fresh troops. So it's going to make it very difficult for the Allies to to shift them from the north coast of Papua. It's just a, a fascinating chapter. When it comes to visiting it today, David, is it is it an area that's easy to get to? It is much easier than, um, say, going to some of the places on Kokoda. So, for example, the big ticket places in, in, in Kokoda is places like Brigade Hill and, of course, Isarava, where the, where the memorial with the four granite pillars are. And they are really only accessible by walking or, if you're lucky, flying in by helicopter. So it is more accessible. Today, um, there is a, the main centre, if you will, in the Oro province where all, where all of those places I just mentioned are. Um, is um, Poppendetta, and Poppendetta has, uh, you know, a, a, an internationally rated tarmac now, and you can just get regular domestic services out to um, Poppendetta Airport, which is actually called Girawa. And as a note, um, Girawa is where the Japanese had established their, um, um, their their supply line, if you will, where they ran the Kokoda campaign. It's also the area where um, the uh, Allies had opened up air, airfields just prior to this. Uh, very campaign that we're talking about. So it is one of the more accessible places, actually. But of course, it doesn't have the same attention as Kokoda. So um, one, you don't have enough um, uh, interest in it to, to for, for, for to have really taken off like Kokoda. And and but but secondly of all, it, you know, it's something that um, um, you can get to. It is very easy to get to, relatively speaking, for other places in PNG. How long would it take to tour the the, the beachheads? Oh, to do it justice, you'd want um, at least a couple of days. You could easily do it in, in, in two to three days. Uh, it's only half an hour flying time from Port Moresby. Um, and in fact, when you land at Poppendetta, although the airstrip has, has, has been upgraded, it's, it's a proper tarmac, unlike Kokoda, where it's still, although Kokoda's been white, it's still a grass airstrip. But, um, you know, it's only 30 minutes away. And when you fly in, you can still see these horseshoe, which were the, um, you know, the dugouts, if you will, where they could they could um, give some protection um, for the Allies, some protection for their planes and, 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 and fuel and things like that. So you can still see the remnants of war immediately when you land. There is a, um, a, a hotel or a motel, for want of a better term, in Poppendetta itself in supermarkets. And, you know, you can base yourself there and you can access Gona, Buna and San Ananda either by road or um, the way that I like to go is by going down to one of the points and using a boat to get around to those three main points. Well, let's do our battle walk. I mean, it's it's not so much of a walk as a tour, but uh, it's it's a fascinating area. So, give us a rundown on a, on a tour that we're going to take as we as we tour the beachheads on the north coast of New Guinea. So, the way I I normally do it, and as I said just a moment ago, I really like going by by boat just just because you get to see the coastline and you get to put things 
in greater uh, perspective. So I normally start at um, at Gona. So to give you an idea, we would arrive um, usually from Kokoda because people who have come out to do the touring that not walking, they would have driven down, have flown into Popendetta, driven down, had a look at Kokoda, driven back and had a look at all those places like Oivi Garari, the Kamusi River, etc. And then I usually take people and we start at Gona itself. Now, Gona is a beach. It's imagine a dark volcanic sand. There is um, really only two uh, official uh, monuments that are left out on the battlefield. One is at Gona and one is at Buna, which we'll get to later. On the way through Popendetta, though, I should mention there is a lovely memorial there, lovely war memorial there, and it has all the original plaques, that, these big bronze plaques that used to sit out on those battlefields at some time in um, uh, um, you know, not in the last 30, 40 years, they were brought in and they've made a, a nice uh, memorial park and they've brought those plaques in. So, you know, we always have a look at that and we drive on a bumpy uh, road, but if people are getting to Goni, you've probably already done the bumpy road to and from <laughs> from Kokoda and it's a dirt road that takes you out of Popendetta town and you're looking left and right of this dirt bumpy road with um, a lot of um, plantations, which are palm oil. And um, you eventually head down to the wonderful um, Gona Beach with its, um, it's got a creek, which is, which is mentioned in just about any history of, of Gona, which featured in the, in the campaign. And you've got, um, as I said, this wonderful volcanic soil, but you're looking out into the magnificent um, Solomon Sea. So try and pick, uh, you know, picture in your mind, um, you know, um, uh, palm trees uh, on the beach, you know, coconut palms, the the water lapping up against this black uh, volcanic sound. It, uh, sand. It actually reminds me of that scene um, in um, the World War Two um, um, American film on on um, on on Gorda Canal. Um, and now I've had a mental blank. Thin red line. Um, you can imagine that that's the sort of scene that you would uh, that you would come across when you arrived at Gona. I've never done this area of the Pacific, of New Guinea. I've, I haven't actually visited the beachheads, and I'm looking forward to doing that with you, David, when we do our big New Guinea trip. Um, when I've done battlefields like Guadalcanal, other parts of New Guinea and other parts of the Solomon Islands, there's not much left from the war, but you will you can imagine it when you're there. You can stand on a beach and imagine what happened as the Allies came in and the Japanese defended, and you can head to places like the Tenerau on... on uh, on Guadalcanal and, and imagine what it was like as the Japanese tried to cross that that river. Uh, is it like that on the beachheads? Can you picture in your mind's eye what it was like, the fighting there? Oh, you definitely. Um, look, you're right. There isn't a huge lot of detritus left left there. A lot of it's either changed because um, the environment's changed over time with the sand, shifting sands, etc., or it's been uh, removed. You do see a plane, um, a B-25 at Popendetta when you go through, but there isn't a lot of that type of stuff left over. But you can certainly picture in your mind because it is unchanged. There is the palm oil, as I said, but when you get down on the beach itself, other than a little ramp there that the vehicles uh, drive up, um, you will you will um, be able to imagine as it was 80 years ago. Same sand, same trees. In fact, there's some big trees just, just as you hit the beach that I'm sure were there during the campaign. And it, again, is, is, is relatively untouched. What was the fighting like in this area, David? The fighting there was um, uh, really, really uh, bad in the sense that you've got Japanese, who you mentioned before, Matt, who uh, uh, know that it's their last stand. Uh, they're dug in and they've made um, all along the beachheads, they basically built these pillboxes that were... Uh, you know, think in your mind, you know, these defensive positions. Usually we think about, say, Normandy or you think about these big concrete bunkers and some are, you know, mainly almost subterranean in a, in a, subterranean in a sense. But the Japanese had had months to, you know, build up their defences there. And what they did is that they lopped down um, coconut palms, they used corrugated iron and they had 44-gallon drums, you know, fuel drums, and they'd fill those with sand. They'd interlock them with the... Um, with, with the coconut palms and put a, um, a like a corrugated iron um, uh, roof on it. And, of course, whilst um, the fighting was going up in the Owen Stanleys, they were left, they were unmolested basically down um, down on the beachheads. And, of course, it doesn't take long for the jungle to, to grow over the top of these um, pillboxes. And, of course, they had their slits at the front that they could look out with their machine guns and their um, rifles, etc., the other thing to note is they didn't just build one, they built them in a diamond formation. So they each were able to give 
mutual uh, fire to the other bunker. So they were very, very um, uh, difficult to attack. So if you attacked one, there was another bunker that could focus its attention. And the men came up with a terribly tough time, um, especially the Australians at Gona when they first went down there. A lot of them had not... Um, had time to do reconnaissance, so they didn't have much of an intelligence picture of where the Japanese were. Um, for example, um, uh, the Gona, which was the first of the three uh, uh, positions, the Japanese positions on the beachheads to fall, was set about by the 39th Battalion. We'd mentioned those in the Kokoda podcast. The 39th Battalion had been um, relieved um, just prior to Brigade Hill. They'd been re-equipped. They came back into, they had some reinforcements with them, and they went back into um to uh, fight at um, at the northern beachheads relatively um, soon after that Kokoda and those other areas were opened up and as I said they had um, they had little time to get um, intelligence um, they also had the 21st Brigade with them these are the guys who uh, Bruce Kingsbury that got the VC to Sarava had belonged to again they all came over they flew back they'd been in Moresby at this stage after they'd been relieved after Brigade Hill they flew back over um, and they uh, reformed the 30th Brigade, which had um, had now the 30, 30, um, um, 9th and the, and the 49th from Queensland, but they'd also had now the 53rd Militia Battalion. These are the guys who had been up on the at, at Isarava on the right flank. They were the, probably the most untrained um, Australian soldiers we had up there, and they have amalgamated with the 55th, who had done some garrison duty at Milne Bay but not been involved with the battle so you had a lot of you had some men in uh, certainly in their ranks that had fought the japanese already but you had a lot of men who were going in to battle for the first time and they were going up against as we said a well-determined enemy was dug in had plenty of time to um build their defenses and of course the australians didn't have really the intelligence to know where they were what are we going to see in this area at at, at, uh, at gona as we as we tour the ground well, at Gona, um, as I said, don't expect to see um, anything that will... You have to use your imagination, but there is uh, uh, the, the Gona Creek, which features in the history. In fact, a, a good friend of mine who's since passed away, um, Alan Kangamore, he until recently was the last officer left of the 39th Battalion. And Kanga was actually one of those guys who had been uh, held back in Moresby. So he didn't, he didn't fight on um he hadn't seen any fighting in the war prior to going to new guinea but he didn't fight in the owen stanley campaign he was one of the guys they kept some of them back in reserve to keep the battalion going and to reorganize as reinforcements would come up and his first battle was actually at gona and um, that creek that i i mentioned uh, one of the stories that he told me was that um, they came across a line of japanese coming down on one side of the creek and they were on the other and um uh, they, you know, they were just, they didn't realise that they'd run into each other, both groups, and they both looked at each other, pointed their weapons at each other, were stunned, and they both slowly crept back into the um, into the jungle. There's another story where a wild pig um, ran ran across near to that creek too, and they opened up fire, but obviously it wasn't, it wasn't the enemy. So you have to think that um, although there are structures there to see, the ground is un, un, relatively untouched. Some of those features, like the creek line, is still there. The um, Solomon Sea lapping on that on the on the organic soft black organic um, volcanic I should say sand is as you would have seen it and of course the tree lines uh, are very similar the bush that you would see so we've got different scrub going on it's very different than if you went up into the um, into the mountains you're going to have a lot of kunai grass you've got swampy areas it's wet underfoot uh, during the um, northern beachheads campaign there'd been an um, you know, we we're coming towards the end. So we're talking November into December and even into January when it finally finished. So you've got wet season coming on. So it became a quagmire in places. And of course, the ever present, present um, malaria and scrub typhoid. So it's, so, you know, all these things that I'm trying to conjure up a, an image when we walk across the ground and we have the map and we do map to ground and we show you where these uh, places were, um, you know, again, you have to use your imagination. But the good thing is, that you have this third character which is still there and that is the the terrain and the bush and, and it's relatively what, what the soldiers would have seen 80 years ago. If it's opened up and less mountainous country around there, David, what about tanks? Were they employed in great numbers during the beachhead campaigns? They they were, but they were up further up along the um, – along. so we're at Gona at the moment. Um, they, they come into play, the M3 Stuart tanks, which were commanded by – 
Australians, they also had Bren gun carriers, so the small um, weapons carriers, uh, open you know open top tra- tracked vehicles. Uh, they they were brought out to play. Um, in fact, when you go to visit the beachheads prior to going out there, or, or after, you can go to the National Museum in Moresby and you can see one of the um, tanks that was um, captured was taken out by the Japanese um, and and is now resting in in Port Moresby. You can see what. Um, you can see what they looked like. They weren't relatively big. They were quite small. The unfortunate thing is, as I said before, you get wet season. You have, um, um, at, at the time, the battles were going on and the tanks uh, didn't, you know, they, they were, I guess they were good to a sense to go up against the um, um, the Japanese pillboxes. But the issue was that the ground wasn't really suitable for tanks. You know, we were looking at soft swampy ground and you can imagine what that would do to a tank. It got bulked and most of those pillboxes had to be taken by um, infantrymen um, charging them. In fact, um, I interviewed a couple of veterans of the 55th, 53rd, and, you know, there's talk of them, um, you know, attacking and taking one um, pillboxes and they would throw grenades in there. In fact, they also had makeshift, um, uh, which could be, uh, you know, uh, weapons to be able to open these bunkers up, if you will, and some of them were... um, a can of fuel that they could get the fuel inside the, the bunker and um, and get the Japanese out. And I might add that um, when some of the detritus that you do find, so some of the small things like um, you can find bits of um, Owen gun um, butts come to mind, the skeleton butt of an Owen gun or, or, the, or the breech of a Tommy gun. There's M1 Garands that you can find. The American helmets, for some reason, uh, up at Buna, they, they still, the Australians seem to rust away pretty quick, but the Japanese and the American helmets... Uh, seem to stay, and there's heaps of American helmets up there. Um, that instantly, everyone knows what the shape of a, a World War II American helmet is. Um, but you know, all, all, the, the 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 thing I was going to mention on that is, you do find gas masks. That's another thing that people aren't expecting. Why did they have gas masks? And the gas masks that you're finding are Japanese gas masks. It wasn't because gas was employed, but you could imagine the hot, sweltering uh, humidity of those swamps where there were dead, decaying bodies laying around in these stagnant swampy areas was just disgusting and when you read the japanese accounts a lot of japanese actually because the gas mask was part of their kit whilst they weren't using it as i said because gas wasn't used there but they did use it because the smell was horrendous and imagine being one of those japanese soldiers inside this um inside a a a pillbox or a bunker you know uh just waiting for the enemy to come and you know you're in there days on end got corrugated iron on the roof imagine you would have been cooking in there and the smell and the decay just would have been disgusting just horrific isn't it so um we've seen gona where are we heading next on our on our boat tour yeah so uh, at, at gona i hop in the but it's really interesting when you get there you see all the uh you see these um they call them banana boats basically they're like a they've got 40 horsepower engines on them and they're, they're quite like a, a fiberglass open top long f- fiber um a glass boat and you see a lot of them lined up already because people use them to trade to take goods up to lay lays way off into the distance uh, but you, they, they go out to sea and these things they also fish and do things like that but when we're there we commandeer them um you know get engaged with local people that and we hop in the in in the um in these boats and basically from gona we go out there's a big uh, coral reef there so we go out on the um uh, in the boat just to get a, away from the reef and then you're looking back at the shoreline and this to me is just one it's a beautiful activity to do and it's a good rest after you've had a bumpy ride from Poppendetta to Gona but you can look back along the coastline you can see the um, coconut palms you can see the village huts that are still there because people still occupy these areas there's still plenty of people living along the coastline um, and in fact we we stay in one of the villages and I always make a, a side tour you can go down to um, what they call Hattie's village which is if you imagine if you're at Gona Beach looking out to sea it's down to the left it probably takes 20 odd minutes down the boat Hattie's village um, le- uh, named after an Australian soldier that died there Lieutenant um, Alan Hattie but um, when you get there you can still see depressions in the ground that are made or, or you know you see craters not huge craters like the western front but nonetheless there are sizable ones that you can walk down into or stand into up to your waist which were obviously uh, from aerial bombardment um, that the allies did because you know towards the end there after the Japanese had had, had some activity with their aircraft we, we had this umbrella fighter umbrella up there and we did control the 
control the skies and we can, you know, the Japanese have got some supplies, not many, but they'd have to come at night so they could avoid, avoid getting shot up by Allied aircraft which were coming out of Port Moresby and now we'd started to open up airfields north, as I said. But on our trip, we go down there. There is a plane. You can go for a little bit of a, a walk and you can go and see an American bomber that's um, down. It didn't get shot down. It had engine trouble and I think they recovered the engine. But the plane is there and it's quite amazing too. To climb, to climb around that. So it's certainly, that's the one big ticket item, but it is hidden in the, in the bush. But as I said, as you walk around Hattie's Village, you'll see some um, depressions and, you, and you'll and you see, um, you know, villages, which of course have been rebuilt recently, but they are built out of the same materials as what Australian and American soldiers would have seen during the during the campaign. So after we do that, we get on the on on back on the boat, and as I said, we're out just a little bit off the. You can still see the coast; you're not going out into the the, the ocean, but you just get a, a, away from this coral reef that sort of hugs the coastline, and we start heading up to um, my favourite spot to on of the northern beachheads for a few reasons. And we get to San Andrew, and usually what happens is uh, in the boat as you you're jumping over the water. It's it's fun. It's a fun activity. You know, you're, you're jumping over the waves in the boat. And um, you get into San and Andrew and usually greeted by, um, you start to see the flagpoles of PNG flag and the Australian flag and the Oro province provincial flag there. And we come in and you're usually greeted by a traditional dancing group um, of the Evergay people, which are the the, 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 the cultural group from San and Andrew. And, um, and you have this wonderful warm welcome. Again, shoreline looks very similar, the, 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 the dark volcanic sand and... Um, that's where we arrive. And when I visit the Northern Beachheads, that's where I stay. I stay in the village of San Ananda Point, which as a side note, is actually not the original coastline. The original coastline is behind it. In 1951, I think it was, Mount Lamington um, uh, erupted and San Ananda um, uh, was affected by that. And it's actually got this extra piece of land, So, which is a good thing because we'll get to that in a moment because the original shoreline has been protected and it's behind the village that I stay at. In San Ananda, but as I said, when you arrive, you get this wonderful welcome by the by the people at San Ananda. It's just a I can picture it in my head now. You come on this bumpy road, you get on the boat, you've got the spray of the sea, and you come in to be this wonderful. I, I you, you have to experience to get the welcome. It's amazing. So tell us about the sights from the Second World War we're going to see in San Ananda. So in San Ananda, um, which is the last, by the way, Gona was the first to fall to the Allies, and then San Ananda Buna happens, but San Ananda is the last to, to fall in January of 1943. But I, but it's the next stop along the way when you're touring them. And at San Ananda, as I said, we've got this, um, the, the original shoreline where the Japanese um, um, had landed in, in part because you're near Basaboa, which was the original landing site when the Japanese um, came down on uh, 21 July, which kicked off the Kokoda campaign, if you will. And and you cross, we cross this creek. You can wait, it depends, it's tidal because it's now a creek where the original shoreline was, where we land on the point at San Ananda. You cross this creek. It's murky and it's a bit bit slimy. It depends on when the tide comes down. And we usually punt on one of those banana boats. You punt across to get to the other side. But um, it's about up to your waist. And when you look down, though, if you punt around, you can see, and it kind of, I mentioned this on the Milne Bay podcast, I mean, you can see the skeletal remains, if you will, of the Japanese Daihatsu landing barges, there's a couple of them there. So you can go over them and you wouldn't know they were there unless someone showed you because you can just see the outline of them. And I show usually show people pictures of what they were like the war. So that's from the war. So that's the first thing you see. And when you get onto the other side of the bank there, unfortunately he passed away a guy named Ananias and he was a wonderful chap and he looked after a memorial there. And if you remember earlier, I spoke about that there's only two main official memorials out on the Australian ones anyway, out on the northern beaches. And they're at Gona and, and at Boona. But at San Ananda in the 70s, I think it was, a man named Frank Budden, who was a member of the 55th, 53rd Battalion. He was an officer. He also wrote the history, the mice of Moresby. He'd came up with some veterans and I didn't meet him. He passed away before I um, started getting into the history. But I did met, meet a guy named um, Jack Stevens, who also has passed away, but he was there on that on that trip. And the story goes that Ananias came out and Frank Budden had this little plaque, only a tiny bronze plaque. It had fit in the palm of your two hands put together, was placed there. And that was the only memorial for many, many years um, that represented what happened there. And for, for, for listeners, if you don't know, that battalion that I spoke about, the 55th, 53rd, they attacked um, towards San Ananda on the San Ananda Road uh, and their date in history is very easy to remember because it happened on the 7th 
of December, so a year after the um, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, and it was a huge devastation to that battalion. Remember, some of them had seen some fighting, but a lot of them weren't. This is their first battle, and the 55th, 53rd on the 7th of December, um, that Sydney battalion had run had had run up against the Japanese, and in the space of a day, they they'd had 180 casualties out of the battalion, either killed, missing, or wounded, and um, it just is extraordinary. So this little, uh, so what we'll see there is there's a collection of of stuff because a lot of, lot of stuff you won't see so much on the track. You see more down here, and I'm saying small items like shells and, as I said, gas masks before and helmets and, and things like that. But next to this memorial is a little hut, if you will. It has a table which is about up to you, just above your waist height, and the local people, when they tend to their gardens, that's when they find this stuff and they lay it all out. And um, it's a great opportunity to have a look at all this different stuff. You've got push bikes. You wouldn't know it unless you picked it up in your hand and you realise, hang on, what's that? A push bike. How did a push bike get here? What's it doing from the wall? Well, of course, when the Japanese landed, um, they brought push bikes with them. Some of those have been captured um, at Singapore and come via Rabaul down there. So you've got these, um, you know, you're not seeing the whole push bike, but you're seeing rusted parts of the handlebars and stuff like that. You've got... Um, uh, saddle, uh, pack saddle frames for saddles, for pack saddles, because the Japanese had brought down with them horses and they had a lot of horses that would move their supplies from the beachheads up. So you're seeing a lot of this stuff. Recently, as in um, 2018, I had the pleasure to take descendants of the 55th, 53rd back. They kept the Frank Budden Memorial, but they had a rededication. The Australian High Commissioner and the head of the Army mission up there had came out and uh, we'd put in this plaque so there's a little memorial garden there and it has some plaques which have been put there by descendants and associations which are really the only thing on the battlefield but it is worth seeing to think that you know not only did veterans come back after war but their immediate you know sons and daughters came back and it's a real treat it's probably to my mind the most special part of any of the places that you can see in Papua for that very reason because people have made that pilgrimage and it's a very personal memorial. What other sites are there to see in San Ananda, David? So at San Ananda, there is a road which would eventually take you all the way back to Popandita, but it roughly follows or parallels in a lot of places the San Ananda track. And if you walk along it far enough, you can go up to a place called Huggins Roadblock, which was uh, uh, named after an American officer who um, had put in a... a um, so you've got to imagine we're going the opposite way to what the Allies were coming. We're coming from the Japanese direction. But you can walk along this, um, what they call the San Ananda Road. In fact, some of the battle honours will have San Ananda Road on them, especially for the 55th, 53rd, for example. And we walk along... Uh, not everyone might want to do the walk, but it's on a, on a, um, a flat... It is flat, but it is quite bumpy because um, in the in the not so recent past we had uh, we had a, the Americans came up there and um, built a built laid down this um, base to 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 give the people you know some break from this because it's still a swampy you know area at the best of times, but they could get vehicles in there. So we, as I said, it parallels the um, the road, and as when you get up there, you can see a wheelway. There is a wreck, wreck of an Australian wheelway. Um, um, that you see in a village. That's one of the first stops. There's also, which I find is remarkable, there is the remnants of, on the right-hand side, going up that track of the Japanese hospital. And I still remember the first time I was ever shown it. Uh, there was just, and they're, st they're still there. There's all these rice bowls with, and you, they're, they're like enamel, blue and white enamel. And when you turn them over, they've got the uh, anchor of the Japanese Navy on them. And there are still vials of morphine still in their glass. There is... Uh, um, there is even, um, there must have been some sort of dental thing attached to the Japanese hospital because there's these, um, you know, false uh, teeth. Uh, there is um, there is plenty of medical um, rusted out, um, what would have, must have held bandages and things like that. And of course, there is still signal. There's still a lot of signal equipment, even, um, you know, the um, insulators and stuff. And you, it's quite a large area. And um, although it would have been obviously makeshift, um, there wouldn't have been buildings, it would have been tented. And those sorts of things, but the equipment that the Japanese had there, there's this high concentration of this on this side of what is known as a Japanese hospital. And you could walk straight by it if you didn't know where it is, because obviously it's all overgrown. And, and moving on from there as we head towards Huggins Roadblock, again, you can go into you, you sort of get off this new road and you get back on the Sand and Anna track proper, and you can pick up where the track is there. And there was there's wheels off horse and carts, Japanese. They must have had some sort of carts, and you can still find the iron that 
that made up the wheels. And um, again, as I said about Hattie's Village, there are big craters and, in fact, the largest one I've ever seen. Because you imagine this whole area, which was swampy and the Japanese were hidden, well camouflaged, and the, the Allies attempted to, to, to bomb it. And and on, on this part that we are now, there is a huge crater. It's the biggest one that I know of out there in the bush. There might be others, but this is huge. Like you can actually still, you know, slide down on, into it and walk around and look and you realise this is the crater that's been made from a bomb, an aerial bombardment. And as you as you go up through there, you can um, you get back and you can see, you know, where a roadway, where a track would have been because even though it's overgrown, it's swampy and it's, it's still as miserable as as what it is was it was rather eighty years ago, and when you read the history, you talk of of men. I mentioned a veteran before, Jack Stevens. He told me that he only ever once slept without his boots on because they had um, a cause to stand to at, at night. There must have, obviously must have been some activity, and as he did, he'd had his boots off and he'd stepped on a piece of kunai grass that had been cut down and cleared, and he said it was like a, a metal spike going into. He cut his foot. And you can still see those that um, um, that area and the scrub typhoid, which a lot of soldiers complained of, that was one of the ailments that took a lot of soldiers off. That still is ever present. Obviously, we're only going to go in there for a moment. We're not going to live in it. But the mosquitoes and the swampy area, uh, when you go off the San Ananda track, really uh, brings you so close to what it would have been for an Australian or an American soldier 80 years ago. Well, David, now let's talk about the last of the three sites we're going to visit, which is Boona, and tell us about what went on there and what you can see there today. Yeah, indeed. So imagine we've done our walk and we've gone back to San Ananda, to the village where we've had a wonderful stay. And then the next day, what I usually do is we get back in the boat. So again, wonderful, um, um, you know, um, way to get around. You can drive to all these points, but trust me, in the boat, it's actually a lot smoother, a lot quicker and a lot more enjoyable. So we get out of San Ananda on the boat and we go up to uh, to Boona and when you hit Boona Beach, there's um, uh, there's a quite a really nice, because uh, you can imagine it, because it's volcanic uh, sand, the water's quite murky. It's not that the water's not clean, it's just that the, the, the sand is dark. But at Boona, I always jump off the boat as it, as it's just as it's pulling up. So it's, this is literally these banana boats that reverse themselves onto, onto sand. And when you get there at Boona, as I said, there's a nice swim. The first thing you see is you see that other... Um, uh, memorial Khan, the the official Memorial Khan, which was built, as I said, the original ones had been that had been there immediately after the war, are now in Popendetta, which we would have seen. And there is a clinic. The first thing you see is a clinic. There is a, the wreckage um, of what I believe is a Japanese plane. There's also a wing of another plane standing up on its side that someone's propped up. So immediately when you get there, you realise, oh, okay, we're in, we're in. Um, we certainly know that the war has been here. And um, there's also a, a big. Um, a, a memorial that the American Legion, so like the RSL, has placed there, which talks about the battles the Americans fought because Boona is really um, a big thing for the Americans and this is the area that they saw the most fighting in. And when you start to walk through the village of Boona, you um, you get up to um, um, you get up to the uh, centre of the town, if you will, and the one thing that sticks out is tracks. We spoke about tanks earlier, Bren gun um, tracks because the Bren gun carriers were taken out and the locals are using those like borders for their garden because all the villages you see are beautifully maintained and very clean around people's huts and you'll see these wonderful little gardens of flowers and that which have been bordered by these tank uh, tracks and on the left hand side as you walk up through the centre of Boona you see um, there's, a, there's a, a lovely collection of things there in fact until recently there was bones believe it or not in bag they believed that they were um, Japanese bones because the Japanese um, did themselves come back and do a lot of work in that area to try and repatriate, uh, well not repatriate sorry that's wrong, that to, 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 to get the bones of their ancestors they would actually cremate them on site which is um, which is, is something that the Japanese culture does and and you, um, I remember the first time I walked up there, you won't see them that often now because that activity but it wouldn't be un, un um, you know, uh, unusual to see bones in, in, in these little, I call them museums, but you imagine they're a collection of things that the local people have dug up. Some of the interesting stuff that you would see, <coughs> pardon me, in the, um, 
in Buna is um, uh, I remember picking up a Japanese helmet still there with the anchor for because the star was for the army but the special naval landing force these are the guys that opened up the beachhead that's pretty amazing and seeing even toothbrush um, you know you've got um, shaving uh, you've got American cutlery you've got cups canteens that the Americans had which are very um, similar to what you know the modern Australian army has you know they the water bottle fits in them all that stuff's there and as we move along from Buna. Um, I get people to use their imagination because it was in that spot that that famous George Silk photograph of um, of um, the Australian soldier in the Papuan um, coming down, uh, marching along. I'm sure people in their their mind um, can conjure up that image. You're actually standing pretty much on that spot where that photo was taken. And as we as we move up along through Buna, um, there is some more plane wreckages, but importantly, you can. It's all covered in kunai. You go past the school. There's some engines of planes, and there's some more depressions where aerial bombardment is. But then we cut out into the kunai grass, and I must say, Matt, the one thing that comes to my mind, if the viewer can, uh, sorry, the listener could um, um, conjure up in their mind, is that sound of the kunai grass waving in the in the wind. Uh, it just makes this. Um, this distinct noise and as we cross the kunai you can start to see where the ground is fairly level and that's where the Japanese had an airstrip and there is a gun still in its original place this is a naval gun that the Japanese um, um, uh, had put there to protect their airfield when they set an airfield up there at the start of the campaign and the gun and the box where the ammunition is still in its original original spot which is quite amazing but I must say, man, that's that part of Boona. But as we come back through Boona and we walk past the um, where our boat is, is pulled up on the beach, we take another little side tour. And this is one of the most amazing things that um, you will see, and that is that there is an area. There's probably more of them still out there covered in scrub, but this is an area where you can actually view one of those diamond formations of Japanese bunkers. Now, one of them is in particularly good order. Obviously, the coconut palms have long rotted away and the corrugated iron has rusted and that but the 44 gallon drums are still in their original spot where they had that they made these bunkers out of that i mentioned earlier and you can see you stand in the village that somebody lives there you stand in one of the the yards of one of the people who lived in Buna, and you can look and you can see the diamond formation of these bunkers and you realize when you're in the center of them how hard they would have been as the soldiers had to attack the allies had to attack really with rifle, gran grenade and makeshift um, weapon systems to blow these bunkers open, how hard it would have been and how ingenious the Japanese, I guess, had built these bunkers again above the ground in diamond formation where they all mutually supported one another. It's just amazing to think that they are still in place and they were made out of makeshift materials like the 44-gallon drums. They're still there 80 years on. It's, uh, um, I mean, they're probably not going to be there forever, but if you get the chance, you have to go and see see how the, how the Japanese defended this position. Just extraordinary, David. It's an extraordinary area and I'm, I'm, I'm really glad we get to walk the ground in this virtual sense to bring it to more people's attention. And I know it's not going to be a destination that people are going to rush out and visit like they will with Gallipoli or France or, or if you're in the UK heading over to the Somme or up to the Ypres Salient. I know it's not, it's not quite the same. But if you are going to do a trip to New Guinea, if you are going to do the Kokoda track, then absolutely you should be including the beachheads as well because just a vital part of the story and and one that we just overlook um, too much. It, it, it sounds like it's a place that uh, that has a special place in your heart, David. It does. And for, for two reasons. One, because as we said earlier, it doesn't get the same attention um, that it does. And I have met more veterans, I guess, well, more units served there for a start, but I met more veterans um, that fought at the at the beachheads than I have on Kokoda. I mean, I met a lot of them, but in particular, especially that cohort of the 55th, 53rd, I worked with them at Concord taking children around the walkway and I heard their story. So that, that, that holds a special place for me. But the second thing is that the hospitality that you get, like when you walk Kokoda, you get the hospitality, but you're moving through the villages. When we visit the beachheads, you're actually staying for an extended period, you know, you'll do a couple of nights in the village and you get the hospitality of these people and you'll hear the stories that have been passed down from then, what it would have been like when they had to, when their um, fathers and grandfathers had to had to leave and abandon their villages. And you get that sense of it's still relevant, um, you know, it still affects people's lives to these days. Um, and it is, for my mind, one of the 
Um, if you you know if you are going to go to New Guinea, you have to go to the northern beachheads. As I said, sixteen hundred Australians, um, you know, um, um, or twelve twelve hundred and sixty one was the figure actually of killed over two thousand wounded. Uh, Seven hundred and thirty four Americans were killed there. Two thousand of them were wounded, and you know between um, the uh, uh, the Kokoda campaign and the northern beachheads, an estimated fourteen thousand um, Japanese casualties so it's just it's an extraordinary numbers extraordinary battles and you know it goes all the way from july of 42 until january of 43 so it's it should be in the it should be more in the collective um, minds of australians to pay um, a visit and a pilgrimage to the young australians that lost their lives fighting for australia very well said, David. And I look forward to, in the very near future, getting over there with you and walking that ground. It'll be a be a rare privilege. But um, thank you very much for your time, David. And if you're listening to this, um, let us know what you think. Uh, have you got any plans to visit the battlefields of New Guinea? Uh, don't forget you can do so with our company, with Matt McLaughlin Battlefield Tours. And David personally leads some of those tours and the rest of his team do a great job leading our tours of New Guinea. But but certainly jump on the socials and tell us what you think about these battles of the beachheads. You can find us on Twitter. Look for me at Matt McLaughlin on Twitter. Uh, look for us on Facebook, uh, either at Matt McLaughlin Battlefield Tours or Living History. Um, don't forget my book. If you're interested in World War II history, my book on the Cowra Breakout is out now and you can order that online. But just follow us on socials to hear all about everything we're doing, uh, particularly with this World War II history because it's a significant chapter and we're enjoying some great anniversaries at the moment, commemorating these battles. David Howell, as always, a real pleasure. Thank you for joining us on Battle Walks. Thanks for having me, Matt.